Hi there everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage and I'm bringing to you a video of something you don't see very often. I am actually sewing on a project here at home and the reason you don't see many videos of me doing this is because I don't do it often. I am not a sewer. I am an am I'm not even an amateur. I am a person who's trying to repair something and doing the best I can. But I wanted to make this video to give you an example of how vintage sewing machines can be a really great help. I have a, uh, this is a comforter, and I bought this some years ago, and it, uh, I like the color, I like the pattern, and it has, you can see here on the sides, you know it has a finished edge. Well these edges have, uh, over time, it was all, the edges were all blue, they have frayed, sometimes frayed really badly, particularly on, you know, the end where you, you typically would grab the comforter in the middle of the night type of thing. So I decided that I wanted to repair it myself. And I thought, oh, what will I do? Well, I, I typically have a variety of sewing machines available to me. Currently, <laughs> as of now, I am currently using as my own machine this Neki BU Mira. Now, the Mira I've talked about before uh, as a... Uh, an amazing machine, but I say that about all the machines I restore. You guys know that. So uh, this machine is one of the heavy, really heavy duty machines other than the Singer 1591, which is uh, arguably one of the strongest of the straight stitch vintage machines. In terms of zigzag, which I'm not actually using right now, the Neki BU Mira is one of the great machines. Not the only one by, by any means, but it is certainly one of the great machines from this era. Now, I'm going to show you guys uh, my version of sewing, whatever that means. Those of you who are expert sewers, will, I'm sure you will notice all kinds of mistakes. And, uh, but uh, try not to be too hard on me because I'm doing the best I can here. And I uh, mainly wanted to show you, uh, again, something you never see, which is me doing sewing, not just test stitching. And uh, I'm not going to do the whole project here. In fact, I'm almost done. I wanted to show this to you guys uh, as I'm wrapping up. With the sewing part but i wanted to talk about uh this machine specifically why i'm glad i have it now and some of you might think well this is the perfect machine because this guy who restores machines thinks it's awesome he's even in using it as his own well it is an awesome machine uh in many ways but like everything there are compromises and i'll talk a little bit about those but let me set the uh the tripod down here i have a little micro tripod in my hand Okay, guys, I positioned the tripod in a place, hopefully, there's a, we've got some wonderful afternoon sun, but I'm going to angle this down. Maybe that hopefully give you guys a pretty good view, and I won't get in the way of this one. So what did I do? I, I went and I ordered some binding. I think this is what this is called. And it is made from, I, I love linen, but this is like a linen cotton blend. I bought it on Etsy. I think it came from the United Kingdom. Um... I bought it. It's kind of like a neutral, it might be a natural linen color, I don't know. And it came pre-pressed, right? And you can see that it's already folded over so that when you go to to uh, put it, use it as edging, you can simply stitch it in place and um, you uh, hopefully will be good to go. Now I've done all, <clears throat> let's see, three sides and I'm finishing up the last side. And I wanted to show this to you guys, and I, I am not a big fan of pins. And the reason I'm not a fan of pins is because I find a hard time grip, grabbing a hold of them. They, they, I find them a real pain, and I, and I wanted to be able to move quickly. So I found, um, let's see, I found these, these little, uh, they go on the edge. I believe they're designed for, uh, for quilting, maybe. I don't know. They look like... Uh, giant clips and they have uh, they have you know numbered markings on them for for allowances what i'm doing with them is simply using them to hold this uh, this binder in place and i find that this binding tape if you will maybe that's what it's called um, i find that if i use these uh, as a guide uh, in combination with my hands and fingers i'm actually able to center this binding fairly really accurately, which is a big surprise. I thought I was going to have a big mess, to be honest with you. And maybe I do, but uh, it's... 
it's not quite as bad as I imagined. Not quite as much of a circus as you might imagine. So anyway, what I'm doing is I'm gradually feeding through and wrapping this binding tape by, I don't know what, what to call it. Anyway, um, I'm going to be uh, sewing this into this. Uh, and again, you've got basically batting. You've got a fairly fairly dense edge here, guys. And, you know, if you ever had to sew anything like this with a new machine, you know how it can be. Now, for feeding purposes, I am going to, I'm taking this slowly and I'm kind of going through the, through things, uh, trying to keep things straight. And again, you guys bear with me here because the purpose of this video is not to teach people how to sew. <laughs> There are others with far greater sewing talent than I have who could really do a good job at that. But I wanted to show this to you and just to for the novelty of it, because you don't see this often. Uh, when I sew something, it's usually I'm trying to mend or repair something. It doesn't always come out pretty, but, you know, I try to sew holes in the pockets. And, um, you know, I've made, I think I've made, tried to make uh, linen washcloths before or something like that. Anyway, here we go. Uh, let's see how I make out. Let's see here. And as you can see, I can just pull this little piece right off and it's, it's relatively simple to put on and off. And I know some of you, many of you use pins and you like them. You know, there are a lot of sewing projects where you've got to use something to stabilize your layers or you're going to have a mess on your hands. I may end up with a mess on my hands anyway because I'm not a, I don't have, uh, I have virtually no sewing experience or skill. But again, if you don't, don't be scared. Just, you know, it's fabric, guys. And, you know, I'm not doing this for someone else. No one is certainly paying me to sew this. I'm doing it for myself, so... Uh, now, one of the things I am doing here, you might think, oh, well, this, this is a, a Necky BU. This is one of the most powerful vintage sewing machines uh, ever made, and it is. You might wonder, well, why is he holding this? I don't know if you guys can see my hand, but I'm having to guide. This is a queen-size comforter, and while the machine is certainly strong enough, this fabric is very heavy. Now, behind the fabric is a card table I set up. I'm, I'm on this giant, massive necky table, which is one of the biggest tables ever made. But then I put a card table past here because if this fabric, let's see if I can show this to you guys. You can see the table there, guys. A little, it's like a padded card table. And then over here, I have a, a laundry, uh, you know, like a delicates rack. And the reason I've got all of this set up this way is because um, this comforter A is large, so even if it were not as heavy as it is, if I just simply let it drape over, you know, the edge, the edge of the, the sewing table here, the weight can distort my stitching. It can cause, it can really cause stress on the needle. It can help pop a needle. And because this is a comforter, it's really heavy. So I'm basically having to it's like a giant barge and I'm having to guide it. So again, I'm not, uh, you have to be careful when you do this. If you feed it too quickly, you can cause problems with your stitches or the machine or the needle. If I don't uh, help it move enough, yes, it does have feed dogs and they're great, but don't forget, uh, there's a reason why industrial machines often have feed dogs, uh, either a walking foot or they'll have They'll certainly have the, the lower feed dog and they'll even have what's called needle feed because big, big items and heavy fabrics don't move very easily on a typical domestic machine. Any of you who've ever sewn big items, uh, help me out here. Put your comments down and let me know what you think, what your experience has been. But basically, I'm just helping it. Uh, I'm basically helping, helping the machine sew by moving this thing along in cooperation with my feed dogs. If I get too too slow or too far ahead of those feed dogs, I can cause problems. So this is a, uh, you know, it's a learning curve, but, you know, I wanted to do this and I thought, yeah, I could take it to a mending shop. They, there are places in town that will do it for me. I don't think they would charge that much, but what do I know? Um, but 
you know, even if they didn't charge much, I thought, well, gosh, you know, I've got this sewing machine here. And I never really use my machines all that much. Um, you know, I, most of the machines I get my hands on, I restore and find new buyers for. I test them out and do some test stitching, of course. But um, my philosophy on, on these machines is that museums are wonderful. I've seen museum collections of sewing machines, and I really like them. But uh, the machines I restore are not museum pieces. They are vintage machines that were really, they were meant to work. And when they're kept in good condition, they work beautifully. And they obviously work for generations because uh, all of the machines I restore are at least several generations old. Uh, how old they are depends on the model, of course. So I'm working my way down and you guys can see, even with something this thick and heavy, listen to the sound of this necky, right? Uh, it's just an incredibly quiet machine when you consider it's an oscillating hook. It's not a rotary hook, uh, but it sure is smooth like a rotary. I once saw a video of someone, this is obviously someone who can quilt and sew like a master, and she was making something called a mitered corner. And if I ever figure out, if I am ever able to create such such an amazing thing as a mitered corner, I think I think I'll just you know hang my my hang my boots up then and just retire because that is to me just it's like it's like origami but in sewing. <laughs> I have, by the way, I don't know if you guys remember when I was showing this machine, I have a, uh, uh, this Neki is set up with knee control. Uh, Neki gave you the option of doing whichever one you wanted when, when these were new, when these machines were new. Um, and I, I've done both. I think I prefer the knee control, but the main reason I say that is because I'm so tall and many of these sewing tables are not meant for tall tall, tall fellas. Um, I really, uh, trying to, you know, figure out the angle of my foot and the pedal is kind of a pain. So I find the knee, as long as I get my legs and knees under the table, which, which is a challenge in its own right, I find the knee control just, you know, uh, less distracting to me. But, you know, you guys may have very different ideas about that. But anyway, uh, I just want you guys to see this. And by the way, uh, to finish what I started when I was talking about this, so if the Neki BU mirror is so amazing, then what might it lack? What could you possibly want <laughs> other than this? Well, as it turns out, there are plenty of machines that could be better fits. It depends on what you're doing. Let's say you like to do alterations and you... Um, you like to sew uh, lots of cuffs, sleeves maybe. Um, maybe you are sewing, uh, oh gosh, maybe you need to mend something. It's on a, on, a, on a collar, who knows. You can certainly do it on this a machine like this. This is a flatbed machine. Most machines sold in the vintage era, in North America anyway, were flatbeds. And our ancestors did amazing things. They could, my gosh, they could sew little children's clothes, sleeves, right? They had all these techniques for doing so. So you certainly don't have to have a free arm machine to do that. However, there are times when having a free arm is an amazing thing. It can make your life much simpler, depending, again, on what it is you're trying to sew. If you're sewing something that is tube shaped or like a sleeve or a pants cuff, pants leg, those are situations where, um, and I think Neki actually produced a, a free arm version of this machine. Um, I believe they came in cases. I have never seen one. They, they're not very common. Uh, I'd love to get my hands on one. But uh, anyway, free arms are very useful. And of course, you're not limited. If I was doing lots of sewing, which I obviously do not, uh, in addition to having something like this, I could have a Singer 1591 for the super heavy straight stitch projects. Or maybe I could have myself a, um, a free arm. I could have you know more than two machines. You could have three. You could have a free arm machine. A lot of the Kenmore free arms, like the old one I'm still trying to, to resuscitate, 
Uh, those came in carry cases, at least in North America, but of course you could get tables for them. They were very expensive, but you could get them. Point being, um, what is the best machine? You know, what What do you guys think? What What is suits your sewing? You know, um, uh, I, I realize whenever I talk about a machine such as this one or any of the others I've restored, uh, I find all of them wonderful in their own ways, and so it can sometimes sound like I'm saying, oh, this is the best machine, or maybe the next one is. But in fact, they're all the best machine. It depends on your style of sewing. It depends on what, how much room you have. How many machines can you have? Maybe you pick a machine that is, uh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, because you can only have one, or you can only uh, make room for one. But again, it really depends. Maybe it's aesthetic. Maybe you just like the look or the color or who knows. We all have reasons for liking what we like. And I don't know. Eventually, I may find a new home for this one. I may put it up for sale later in the year. But right now, this is mine. Um, I'm actually taking advantage of all the storage in the desk. Remember, this thing has eight drawers. Count them eight, right? There's four on each side. <laughs> this thing holds a lot. So it's actually been a practical piece of furniture for use as a you know a writing desk and so forth. Uh, and I'm sure that people were marketing it as such back in the day. But anyway, here you go, guys. This is, again, the Neki BU Mira. But uh, today I wanted to show you why this Neki came to my rescue. It is strong as an ox. I put it on the low speed setting. Of course, it has that electronic adjustment that Neki was so proud of in the 50s. And basically, uh, it has helped me do this project and doesn't seem to be fussing or complaining a bit. So if any of you uh, have ideas about what is your favorite machine and maybe you know, what do you think? Can there be one machine that does everything? It, it, you know, tell us what kind of sewing you do. Maybe it really uh, suggests that you want more than one machine. <laughs> and I know some of you have a lot more than one machine. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Again, this is not something you see me do often other than doing test stitching, which doesn't count as sewing. Um, anyway, I just wanted to share with you uh, finishing up the project and uh, you can see here I'm almost done. And then I will be able to have preserved this comforter that I really like. And uh, we'll see what, who knows, maybe I'll uh, graduate to making a napkin or a dish towel. Who knows? <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody.